Ave Maria, and welcome to Divine Poetry, a series that explores the chronological parallels between the history of the Catholic Church and the Old Testament. If you're new to this concept, go back and watch my interview with Kevin Davis. The link is in the video description below. To make things more simple, I have divided up church history and the Old Testament into eight color-coded time periods. Below you can see a scrolling bar with the names, dates, and the Old Testament books for each period. Use this timeline to guide you in each video. The color frame of each video will match the time period that we're discussing. Now, let's start today's episode. Hello, and welcome to episode 13 of Divine Poetry. Today, and for the rest of the month of May, I would like to focus on parallels that um, deal specifically with Our Lady in order to honor her in her special month. And um, aside from that, I also want to take us in a new and somewhat different direction in this podcasting series as well. I'm sure almost all of you, if not all of you, are aware that I wrote a book called Divine Poetry, which seeks to demonstrate the absolutely astonishing chronological parallels between the history of the Catholic Church and the history of Israel in the Old Testament. And, you know, those are absolutely amazing. And so I plan on writing other books as well. Um, my next book that I plan on writing, um, I already started it, is the um, the book of Daniel as seen through these parallels. Like there's implications from the parallels, specifically in the books of the Maccabees, that directly, um, I guess, um, illuminate or uh, uh, inform um, the prophecies in the book of Daniel. I had two videos uh, on this podcast previous to this one, number 11 and 12, that that delved into that subject a little bit. But um, in my book, I want to really open up that topic and um, express my thoughts there. But another book, though, a, a third book that I hope I ha hopefully have time to write, God willing, is the um, is the Gospels as well. So, so as I as I just mentioned, the history of the Church and the history of Israel they parallel in chronological order. But so too does it seem that the earthly life of Christ in the Gospels also shares in that same phenomena. So if you line up the uh, history of the church and history of Israel in the Old Testament and the earthly life of Christ in the Gospels, all three of those have chronological parallels from beginning to end. And it's it's mind-blowing. It's awesome. I did a, a podcast with Kevin months ago and where I show the parallels between the Passion of Christ and Vatican II. And so, you know, that 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 one video is, is, um, a, is one subject and a larger tapestry of parallels between the rest of the Gospel and the rest of church history. I mean, you know, the crucifixion is the end of the Gospels, and Vatican II looks like, you know, close to the end of the church's life. I don't know how else to say it. Um, but so, but all things previous to those two events also parallel. So, for instance, let me kind of just run you through the, um, the, broad, the broad view of these parallels with the Gospels and church history. And then I'm going to um, talk today um, about um, one in particular, which is Our Lady of Lords and the Gospel of St. John, Chapter 9, which is the man born blind. But I won't put the course, the cart in front of the horse. All right. So our Lord was born, uh, and then he had an early persecution when, when Herod tried to kill him, and he fled. And then he had a hidden life. For 30 years, he was hidden from public view. Um, but then, of course, um, once he started his public ministry, he was uh, met with increasing popularity and increasing acceptance as he preached his doctrine and more and more believed in him, and he, and he performed miracles, and he became very popular. Um, with increasing popularity and increasing acceptance came increasing uh, opposition from the uh, from the for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and the ruling class, the ones who are threatened by his by his um, his authority. And so, um, as they continued their opposition, um, eventually he was our Lord exiled himself into um, across the Jordan, which is I think it's called Perea, and there he raised Lazarus from the dead, um, and then um, he returned, of course, on Palm Sunday with popular acclaim. Uh, they were shouting uh, Hosanna to the son of David, uh, proclaiming him king. Hosanna was the was the chant or the was the phrase they used to honor a king. And of course, the Pharisees knew this as well. So then, of course, we have his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. Now, excuse me. Um, the church goes through a very similar, um, almost I'm going to say the exact same pattern, and so does the papacy specifically. Um, so you could say that um, you know the church was founded by Christ, and it had an early persecution as well the Roman persecution, and then um, as the papacy, which always had God's authority on earth, it was starting to spread its influence. And Pope St. Leo the Great was one of the things that made him great was his 
his um his spread of papal authority uh, also through diplomatic efforts he was able to increasingly uh, assert the power of the papacy over western europe and so um the the, the papacy and the church uh, grew increasingly popular and um and, and powerful all throughout um uh, christendom until the middle ages when it was um, you know, you had Pope Boniface, I think the eighth, uh, write his bull Unum Sanctum, declaring the high point of papal doctrine. And you can say it in a sense, is that he, he proclaimed in that bull Unum Sanctum that uh, it's, it's necessary for salvation to, for everyone to submit to the, the authority of the Roman pontiff. That was like the absolute um, articulation of papal supremacy. So then you have um, increasing opposition now to the papacy. You have, for instance, Martin Luther's revolt, and then you have... Um, the French Revolution, and then you have the, the Freemasons in the 1800s and the confiscation of the Papal States. So all this is, is diminishing and increasingly opposing the power of the papacy, and, and the church uh, by extension, of course. Um, and then you have the period where the papacy was hidden as prisoners in the Vatican um, after the, the confiscation of the Papal States from 1870 to 1921, when the popes would not come out of the Vatican, and we're going to get into that later today. And then finally, um, the Lateran Treaty brought the papacy back out into the public spotlight again because Vatican City was created. The Pope, um, Pope Pius XI, would appear uh, in public. And then after World War II, you have the, the, the extreme popularity of Pope Pius XII, especially among the Italians. And this mirrors the acclaim that our Lord had on Palm Sunday. In fact, they were proclaim, proclaiming him Christ, uh, Hosanna to the Son of David. Pope Pius XI in 1925 proclaimed the doctrine of Christ the King. So even you have the, the, the doctrines that are proclaimed at certain points in history mirror the actions of our Lord in the Gospels. Okay, then finally, I already mentioned the crucifixion of Christ in Vatican II, um, and there's a whole video on that. And then finally, the resurrection of Christ, and then you have, I guess, the, the restoration of the, of the, of, uh, the, the traditional Catholicism, the Tridentine Rite. Um, and I have actually, that's actually um, another video, or the video I did with, about the crucifixion is partly um, dealing with that topic of the resurrection as well. So it looks like we're in the resurrection period of the church. Anyway, I just want to lay out the overall tapestry of parallels between the gospel and church history because now inside of that general framework, you have amazing details. For instance, when um, the woman who was caught in adultery was brought before our Lord and they, he, remember, they confronted him and said, what are you going to do? Um, are you going to follow the law of Moses or not? And then he went down and he mysteriously with his hand wrote on the ground, um, and there's been, you know, a lot of commentary about what, what was he writing. We don't know exactly for sure what he was writing. I think some of the best um, guesses, for instance, are, are the sins of the Pharisees. I've heard that before. But nonetheless, though, it's mysterious writing by his hand. And the imagery is very, very stark. And then, of course, you have this woman caught in adultery. They want to stone her. So, of course, we know the outcome of that gospel story where he says, let he who is without a sin cast the first stone. Anyway, those two images of the hand writing mysterious words and the um, the accusation of adultery and wanting to kill the, the, the woman, those two things come from the book of Daniel. If you remember in the book of Daniel, there's the hand that appears in, in the palace of King Balthasar and it writes mysterious words on the wall. So there's the hand writing mysterious words. And later in the gospel, of, or in, the, in the book of Daniel, you have the story of Susanna, who was caught, well, she was not caught in adultery. She was accused um, unjustly uh, and falsely of adultery, and Daniel saved her from being stoned to death. Um, that's one example. I mean, you have um, another one would be when Pope St. Pius X lowered the age of Holy Communion, and our Lord, in a corresponding point in the Gospel, says, Suffer not the little children to come to me. We also have, earlier on in the Gospels, our Lord picks his 12 apostles, and then in church history, at that same time period, we have the church sending out missionaries to convert whole nations. You have St. Patrick, the apostle to Ireland. You have St. Cyril and Methodius, the apostles to the Slavs. St. Boniface, the apostle to the Germans. You have St. Augustine of Canterbury, the apostle to the English. So there's, there's the picking of the apostles in church history. Um, okay, so when our Lord says to St. Peter, you are Peter and upon this rock I'll build my church, that corresponding part in church history, they are actually building St. Peter's Basilica over top of the tomb of St. Peter. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay, and then one more example here I'll just throw before I start the actual uh, content of today's video was when our Lord was on top of the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem and he was weeping for Jerusalem. Um, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, so often have I tried to gather you under, um, as, a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not, right? Our Lady of La Salette was weeping for the church and she was doing it on a mountaintop. So again, Totally astonishing. The whole, it seems like the whole Gospels also parallel church history, also parallel the Old Testament, almost in like, a, in like a, some kind of like a triangle, right? I even like to think this. I, I like to say that the Gospels are 
Uh, the focus of cl clearly is on our Lord, who is God the, God the Son. The church is it's the age of the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost was given to the church to guide the church and to, to be the spouse of, um, uh, am I saying that right? Um, well, but so, you, so the church is the age of the Holy Ghost. And, and in some kind of way that I can kind of, I can understand, but I can't articulate, articulate very well, the Old Testament is like God the Father. It's kind of like... Um, uh, before the revelation of the Son was given and the Holy Ghost was given. So anyway, so if, if the Old Testament corresponds to God the Father and the Gospels correspond to God the Son and the church age corresponds to God the Holy Ghost, then you have this almost like this um, this trinity of parallels, if I can say that. And I'm not trying to establish a new doctrine. It's just kind of a way of understanding these these three, um, these three uh, histories all paralleling each other in a fantastic way. Okay, now let's get into... Um, the. Uh, I hope I can make this in time today. <laughs> let's get into the parallels for today. I want to show... Uh, in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 9, the story of the man born blind and how that corresponds with Our Lady of Lourdes. It's really amazing. So let me read. It's a very long chapter. I'm not going to read all of it, but I am going to read some select portions of it. It's like um, maybe like 15 sentences. And then I'll go through and kind of like, you know, delineate some of the parallels there. Okay, so uh, chapter 9, verse 1. And Jesus, passing by, saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who, who hath sinned, this man or his parents? that he should be born blind. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay out of spittle and spread the clay on his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloah, which is interpreted sent. He went therefore and washed and came seeing. Now I'm going to skip all the way to uh, verse 34. Um, the, I, of course, I always encourage you to read these things by yourself. I just don't want to prolong the video unnecessarily by reading reading the Gospels to you when you can just read them yourself. But of course, you know he was he was made to see, and then he was brought before the Sanhedrin, and his parents came. And you, you might, I'm sure you remember the story. Anyway, so now I'm going to, to verse 34, um, and this is the Pharisees. Now they're going to say this because I, I want to quote this one um, this one line because it, it references again being born in sin. So they answered and said to him. This is the Pharisees talking to the man now. Thou wast wholly born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. So then Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Dost thou believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, Thou hast seen him, and he is, and it is he that talketh to thee. And he said, I believe, Lord. And falling down, he adored him. And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world, that they who see not may see, and they who see may become blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard, and they said unto him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you should have not sin. But now you say, We see, your sin remaineth. Okay, so, now the story of Lords. Um, let's see here, of course, um, uh, I, I don't even need to go over it, I guess, because you know it so well, but um, uh, let's see, how can I start this? So when St. Bernadette was, um, when Our Lady was appearing to St. Bernadette, do you remember when, um, I'm sure you do, when Saint Ber when Our Lady told St. Bernadette to go wash her face in the spring? And there really wasn't a spring yet. I mean, it wasn't unearthed yet. So she indicated the direction. St. Bernadette went there and she washed her face in mud. And so she had mud all over her face. So there you have the man being sent to the pool of Siloah, but our Lord, remember, he spit on the ground and made clay or mud and rubbed the, rubbed the mud on his face or over his eyes. So there's St. Bernadette going to, to find a spring with mud on her face, and there's the man going sent to the spring with mud on his face. That's amazing. Okay, then, um, of course, when he did that, he came back, he was able to see. Well, the second miracle of Lourdes was the restoring of a sight to a blind man. And um, I, I, I put his name on the screen because I forget um, so that's that's incredible. Okay, now um, uh, let's see here. Uh, remember the uh, the ruling class at that time. So this is after the French Revolution, and this is the age or the dawning of the age of science or scientism, when man thought the, the, you know the the modern man was ridiculing religion as superstition and turning to science as that which would you know be the, the truth. Right? They were they were counting on it was the worship of man over the worship of God, um, but because of that they were especially reluctant or even completely opposed to seeing any miracles whatsoever. So if you remember that when the man born blind was brought into the synagogue and he and they asked him twice, how, how are you able to see? I've never seen anything like this before. Um, this has to be from God. And some of the Pharisees said, no, um, you know, they, they, they accused our Lord of working on a Sabbath day and that he couldn't be from God. 
But um, then there was a split among the Pharisees. And some of them said, this has to be from God because only God can restore the sight of a blind man. But um, that's the same reaction that the scientists and doctors and, and, the, and the, the Freemasons and the atheists had to the miracles of Lourdes. I mean, all these miracles were happening at Lourdes and they, of course, could not accept um, a priori or right out of the gate. They couldn't accept that the miracles, that it was a miracle because they, they've already rejected miracles. Just like how the Pharisees couldn't accept that our Lord was the Messiah because they've already rejected that, even if proof otherwise was brought before them. And so um, the reaction of the science community at the time of St. Bernadette and the miracles of the Lord's mirrors that of the, of, the, um, of the Pharisees in this gospel passage. Okay, so now, boy here, um, we have, um, all right, so this is, this is also about how our Lord says that um, if, you, um, if you say you can see, then you're blind, your sin remaineth. Well, this is like how these scientists and atheists, they were claiming that they had the light of truth because of science. So because they rejected the miracles, their blindness remains, right? They, they, like they were so blind, they couldn't even see that the absolute oasis of miracles that was, was bubbling up right under their noses. That's how blind they were. Same with the Pharisees. They were accused of being blind because they claimed they could see. They weren't humble. The scientists weren't humble. They were filled with pride. And because of that, they were, they were kept blind even though miracles were happening right under their noses. So it's fantastic. Um, now, another part of this story that's alluded to in the first couple of verses where our Lord was saying, let me just go back and read that again real quick. Um, it says, uh, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Well, okay, Lord's happened in 1858. Two years later, in 1860, the Freemasons, um, the, the Italian Freemasons under the, um, the, the, the thug Garibaldi or Garibaldi and his, his newly, uh, his Lord, um, Victor Emmanuel II, they wanted to take the papal states away from the church, and they hated the papacy because they were Freemasons, and they wanted to unite Italy under one country. So the papal states were taken away in 1860, at least two-thirds of them. In 1870, they were taken away completely. So here you have, the at that time, the, the popes were, um, like I mentioned earlier in this video, they hid themselves in the Vatican. So our Lord saying that... Um, I'm only going, to be, only going to be with you for a short time. Walk with me while you can, while the light is with you, because the time's going to come when, when there will be darkness and no man can work. Am I, am I quoting that correctly? Yes. Um, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Well, the papacy was, was taken out of the world, so to speak. It was taken out of politics and, and finances. It was, it was put into um, a prison, so to speak, when, when the popes would not leave the Vatican and were called prisoners in the Vatican. Like, you know, the Freemasons completely boxed in the papacy and... Um, and stuff like kind of smothered the light, you know. You had Pope St. Pius X writing encyclicals. Um, you had all the popes were still there and they were valid popes. But what I'm saying is, was like the way the popes used to influence Christendom was completely stopped at that time. Like they were surrounded by atheistic states or um, um, the absence of any Catholic governments, everything. The world, whole world was changing and they were they were alone, um, really kind of like, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know what I'm trying to say. Okay, um, now you can also say even further on, Vatican II is another example of this, um, where the papacy um, has been hidden from us. You know, I don't know how to explain it, but it's, it's a poem, so I don't really have to be exact. I wanted to get into more. Um, I think it's going to have to be sufficient, because I wanted to show, amazingly, this is so cool, in the Gospel of St. Of St. John chapter 8, where our Lord was confronted by everyone outside the temple, and they finally asked him, they said, who do you make yourself out to be? Are, are you claiming to be God? And he said, "He said before Abraham uh, was, I am, which means, you know, Yahweh, I am. He, he was claiming there, they knew very well, that's why they wanted to stone him in the next verse, that he was claiming to be God. Well, you know, Vatican I was happening at the same time in 1870, and the popes were claiming papal infallibility, that they were directly God's representatives, and they could not speak errors in matters, matters of faith or morals. Um, they couldn't speak errors. And so the world said to them, who do you think you are, popes? Like, you're, you're just a man, you know, who, uh, who has a big following. You, you know, you're claiming divine origin of some kind. And so instead of, you know, picking up stones, they picked up cannonballs because in 1870, they started to bombard um, Rome with, um, with the, the forces of the Italian Freemasonic army. And they blew down one of the walls of Rome with a cannon, and they marched in, and they interrupted Vatican I. They stopped the council and never reconvened. And from that point on, the popes hid themselves, just like how it says at the end of uh, chapter 8 that our Lord, let's see if I can quote it exactly here. Um, it says, um, they took up stones, therefore, to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, and he went out of the temple. The same thing the popes did. 
Okay, I think that's going to have to suffice. Uh, boy, I hope I did that coherently. I'll try to make up for my deficiencies in speaking with some graphics on the screen. Anyway, um, glory be to God and Ave Maria during this beautiful month of May.